Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Um, so, uh, you had a long weekend. Yeah, yeah. Had a very adventurous weekend. Yeah. Good time was had solving the world's problems with some of my best friends. Excellent. Hopefully, you talk some of them into listening to this podcast. Hope so. So that we can all solve the world's problems together. Hey. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Um, there was some criticism about not responding to comments on Facebook. I hear. Yeah, that's my that's that's on me. I, I'm, I saw them. I just didn't respond. To, I didn't, didn't really say anything. And I will gladly let you take the blame for that, <coughs> even though I saw them also and didn't respond to either. Yeah. Um, it didn't seem necessary. I thought the response was obvious. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, so here we are again, though. Uh, we've got a couple of interesting topics, I think, for you guys today. Um, one of them is kind of good news. So, I mean, kind of. Hey, I like good news. Yeah. Yeah, we don't get to do that very often. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how, we'll see how it all plays out in the, in the end, but, yeah. um, hard to say. Uh, and this has, uh, apparently turned into a martini cast. Uh oh. Um, yeah. So if I start slurring by the end, you all know why. If, if you go into full rant mode. Oh well, that can happen too. <laughs> we can blame the martini. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just uh, loose lips and all that. Yep. Um, you uh, opted out of the martini. Yeah, I'm sticking with with my with my whiskey and rocks. Would you get the Ridgemont Reserve? Yeah, I went Ridgemont tonight. Hmm. Uh, there's such there's such a poor selection in your cabinet. I had to right. I had to settle for the Ridgemont. There's only <laughs> maybe a dozen bourbons to choose from, so yeah, exactly. I get it. And the quality is really low. Oh yeah, yeah. None of them are anything I'm interested in drinking at all. So yeah. all right, well, no. I'll I'll get the other stuff for you next time. You know, I'll. I'll Increase my spending to like twenty bucks a bottle or something. Oh yeah, there get you, you go. Get you the stuff you like. <laughs> Give me something I like. I you mean decrease your spending, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <clears throat> so um, there, an interesting bit of news uh, since last we cast. Last we cast, um, and I, I thought that this was interesting because it's just like a comedy of errors. Yeah. It's like just the string of mis- of mistakes. Um, well, I started slurring already, and I haven't. Even, we, I've barely begun to drink. Oh, we got a long <laughs> ways to go. <laughs> I did, man, I hope not. Um, I was going to try and keep it kind of short this time, like yeah. you know, limited topics. Yeah. Although they are things that we could end up going deep on. Down, we'll see. We, we're going to end up down some rabbit holes. I can mm-hmm. already tell you. That's <laughs> probably probably true. If uh, if our um, talking about it before we hit record is any indication, <coughs> exactly. Yeah. Um. So. The what I thought was really interesting news was our ally, the Israelis, uh, barred entry um, to their country of two of our representatives. Yeah, um, Rashida Tlaib and uh, Ilhan Omar had planned to visit Israel, um, spending their time in the West Bank, and um, Israel initially uh, was going to allow them to visit. Um, their ambassador to the U.S. Uh, Dermer. Um, he said, quote, out of respect for the U.S. Congress and the great alliance between Israel and America. Well, and I think that was the proper answer. If They had, they should have just done that. Yeah. I mean, I get why Israel wouldn't care for these two. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't personally care for either of them. But, I actually kind of like Ilhan Omar. Oh, screw that. But I don't personally care for them. But I think that, you know... They're, we're allies, you know, we give them a ton of money in aid and whatnot. If one, if somebody from our Congress wants to go over there, you roll out the red carpet and you say, hey, yeah. come on over. I got an answer for that, but we'll, we'll get back to it. Okay. Um, now, I think, strangely, what yeah. triggered the change, uh, and here's probably mistake number one, okay. right, is the uh, Trump's tweet. Yeah. Um, where he said it would show great weakness if Israel allowed Representatives Omar and Representative Tlaib to visit. Well, I, I think you're right. I do believe that Trump had a big, big impact on this. Mm-hmm. And whether or not from the tweet or behind closed doors, something was said like, look, yeah. don't do this. I mean, if nothing else, just the president of the U.S. saying, 
essentially giving them license to bar to entry say no, to this. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that, that's probably what it was. Trump kind of opened the door with the tweet. Yeah. And then here we are, you know. It's like, oh, well, if their chief executive says it's okay not to let them in, then let's not let them in. Yeah. We didn't want to anyway, but we were trying to be nice about this. <laughs> yeah, that's well, kind of... Exactly. Um, so that was a... I can't... This is one of those big faux pas by Donald Trump, I think. Like, yeah. don't... Regardless of what you think of the other representatives in the government here, yeah. you should support them in regards to other countries. Like, yeah, I mean, I while I completely agree with you, I understand Donald Trump too much as the man he is mm-hmm. to know that he can do that. Like he, I don't think he can physically do stuff like that. He's just it's you mean not, like let it go? Yeah, like let it go. He yeah. can't. He's it's not the way he's built. It's not the it's not his mentality. Yeah, you know. And well, I mean, it's a fault. I mean, I I absolutely agree. It's a fault. Yeah. But, well, pretty quickly afterwards, yeah, they said, yeah, these ladies can't come in. Yeah, the, the congresswomen can't enter. Yeah. Um. And that, again, was a mistake. Mm. Uh, I think that that had... Uh, Without question. Certainly uh, riled up even um, conservative um, Jews and is- Israel supporters here in the U.S. Yeah. Said, no, no, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> I don't think it's appropriate for you to prevent entry of elected representatives <laughs> of a government with which you're allied. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, regardless of their purposes. Yeah. Um, no. So, like, I would, you know, I think that that would be a big sign in our country that that things were going way off the rails if yeah. we barred entry from elected representatives of like England or something. Oh yeah. Um, I Absolutely. think that that would be a a really terrible sign of the state that we were in. Yeah. Um. But you know, Israel is certainly not the same. As oh. the U.S. And, yeah. And and we can address that more later. But um, now, Rashida Tlaib, just to finish out the timeline of this whole thing, <laughs> yeah. uh, Rashida Tlaib reapplied um, under humanitarian uh, grounds, I guess you'd say, um, to visit her grandmother who's like 90-something years old. Yeah. Um, and, you know, claiming it might be her last chance to see her, which it might. May very well. She's um, 90 years old. That's a... Yeah. Strong possibility. So, and her grandmother lives in the West Bank, which is where they're planning to go anyway. anyway. And uh, and probably to her surprise, <laughs> yeah. um, she was granted entry uh, on just on the condition that she not engage in um, pro BDS activities in Palestine uh, while she was there, which is the um, boycott, divestments, and sanctions movement uh, okay. against Israel. Yeah. It's a pro Palestinian um, movement here in the U.S. Uh, at least primarily, as far as I know, um, that is uh, encouraging people and institutions to not buy products from Israel, um, to uh, divest or uninvest, however you want to look at it, um, from um, Israeli business ventures, etc. Uh, tr- essentially, to try and um, and privately sanction uh, yeah. Israel through the free um, market. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, of course, sanctions is the last thing on there, which is a government yeah. thing. But um, but, but the rest is pretty well private, right? Yeah, boycott and divestment. That's just encouraging, you know, private businessmen, um, private people to not private institutions yeah. to not do business with uh, Israel and Israeli companies. Hmm. Um, which, regardless of what you think about what Israel is doing in terms of their occupation of Palestine. Um, it is a perfectly reasonable way to address uh, it, even a perceived, yeah. you know, human rights abuse. Yeah, I think um, certainly in what claims to be a free market. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, they they said, and I think it's reasonable for them to say, "Hey, if you're going to come over here, yeah, like we don't want you using don't be your a rebel visit, rouser. yeah, as yeah. a platform to speak out against the government of the country that you're visiting." Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that seems fair. Although I, I still don't like it that much, but well, um, it, it it doesn't seem unreasonable to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, then, however, she said that um, it was uh, too restrictive and embarrassing to her, and so she rejected the offer to come visit after all. Huh. Um, to which 
then Trump tweeted something like, well, at least her grandmother doesn't have to see her now or something <laughs> like that because he can't help himself, as oh, you were saying earlier. Yes, yeah, um, he can't. <laughs> it was one of his funnier comments, I thought. Uh, a little, um, you know, not... Well, I can't think of the word that I want to use because uh, I'm getting older and they're all just kind of pouring out. My <laughs> vocabulary used to be there. It's just not anymore. Um, but anyway, so they... Then Israel had to come out with an excuse because their ambassador had said, you know, we're letting these people in out of respect, and then they barred them from entry, and so then he had to backtrack in some way. Um, And they uh, said that they're, you know, that they were planning to visit uh, all their, spend all their time in Palestine. They weren't having any meetings with Israeli officials, etc. And that they, uh, you know, were... um, had the intent of promoting uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions um, stuff. Yeah. But that was all known beforehand when, I mean, th- but, there was nothing, they, there was no new just... information, right? Yeah. And actually, they didn't have any meetings set with Israeli officials, but they didn't have any meetings set with Palestinian officials either. Yeah. So, so you know. Um, so whatever. the only thing that really changed here was Trump's tweet. Yeah. Basically uh, yeah, giving them seems, cover for not right. letting them in. Yeah. And I'll be really disappointed if it comes out in, at some point that he actually contacted them and said, you should just yeah. prevent them from entering. Yeah. Um, it, it is... I, I don't know if anybody achieved what they wanted out of this. Uh, Trump looks like a, Trump looks like an ass. Um, although, actually, so does Tlaib after she reapplied... And then didn't go. And then chose not to go yeah. um, after they said okay. Yeah. Um, Israel uh, looks terrible, although it's not a... in Israel looks terrible in the U.S. Um, in Israel, I don't know that it had much impact yeah. because these... I mean, if anything, it would. Ha- I feel like it would have more of a positive impact for them. Yeah, um, probably, although <coughs> while um, Tlaib and Omar have uh, attained some level of notoriety... Here yeah. in the U.S., they haven't, as far as I know, in Israel. Like, yeah. the Israeli people, they, they barely don't. know who these women are. Yeah. Um, but uh, it could be, you know, good for Trump, who is trying to paint these, you know, the women of the squad, yeah. uh, which includes Ocasio-Cortez and the other girl from the Northwest, who, whose name I can't remember, um, as being the face of the Democrat Party. Yeah. Which, which they're not does- really. Yeah, but that's absolutely his goal to make them look that way. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, that's that's totally cause that's exactly what you want the Democrats to look like is this crazy bunch of people. Yeah, no. I don't know that he's that far off. Maybe, maybe not. Well, you could make an argument either way. I think. I mean, they're certainly the face of the progressive movement in the Democrat Party. Yeah, but I don't think that's representative of, of the entire party. Yeah, or even a majority. Yeah. Um, um, well, I would say it's not a majority now, but they're constant. That's the thing about the Democratic Party is they're always moving further and further. So they may be the fringe now, mm-hmm. but ten years from now, that they're going to be that won't be the fringe anymore. The yeah. fringe will be even further over, and then we'll, they'll be the main part of the. That's party. true. I mean, can you imagine ten years ago, um, somebody declaring themselves a socialist and and yeah. running for? President yeah. of the U.S. Exactly, uh, and and actually having some headwind behind them. Yeah, because I mean that's it's just it's all creep, man. It, you start you start a little bit and further and further mm-hmm. and further. Yeah. Um, now, in in terms of this whole <laughs> debacle, really, yeah. which I I think that we mentioned at every point was a mistake. Yeah. Um, what I will say, though, for Israel is the the idea, and some of the some of the Democrats even have made comments along these lines. Is like th- this is not representative of a free society. Yeah, um, a country that won't allow people that are speaking out against them enter to enter the to enter the uh, state at all. Yeah, um, this is something that like North Korea does. This I was fixing to say. This is very total total totalitarian. There you go. Yeah, it'll come out in a minute. <laughs> Maybe I've had too much whiskey. <laughs> you barely gotten into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's unreal that they that a free society would not allow elected representatives of an allied government, even if they're speaking out against some actions of that of that government. Absolutely. Um, frankly, these women are speaking out against actions of our government. 
Yeah. And I don't consider that to be a terrible thing because that's what we're doing too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not the same things necessarily. No. Well, I mean, we're, yeah, we've got some <laughs> different opinions, but I mean, we're still speaking out against the government. Yeah. yeah. Um, just as a another point on this, um, during this this current recess, uh, co- congressional recess, um, seventy members of Congress. That's that's one in six essentially. It's more yeah. than fifteen percent of Congress um, has uh, visited Israel or really? plans to visit Israel, including wow. our representative actually, Bradley Byrne. Well, I knew Byrne had. Uh, I think Byrne's been before, hasn't he? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... oh, it, it's this giant thing um, that well, they it's... do through the I A E I or I A E A, maybe I don't know. No, that's not it. That's something else. Uh, yeah, that's something else. That's the yeah. International Atomic Energy Agency. Yeah. That's, uh, that's We're going to talk about him later. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Actually, we, maybe not. I don't know if that's can. on our list today. <laughs> no. Who knows? No. We'll see I where mean, it goes. I mean, if we end up in Iran, <laughs> <laughs> well, we can probably talk about them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the, some offshoot from APAC oh, that yeah. uh, it declares itself as a nonprofit and um, collects money to educate hmm. uh, government officials about Israel. Yeah. Um, and they pay for these, like, Really lavish press junkets. Yeah. Well, not press junkets, I guess. But we we'll go over there and meet the people thing. type yeah. thing. Um, we'll let you talk to visit specific places, talk to specific people, and we'll pay for you to have a really nice time while you're there. Yeah. Um, and then you just go back home and vote for things that Israel is interested in. <laughs> and um, now we own you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and we know, of course, APAC is a big <coughs> lobbying organization. And I, I had a discussion with somebody last weekend, um, a friend last weekend. And uh, we're talking about, you know, the idea of reforming um, money in politics, like how contributions are made and how what limitations on contributions and so forth. Yeah. That's, uh, that's not going to answer. That's not going to resolve anything. Yeah. Um, and frankly, I don't have a problem with, uh, you know, an Israel lobby. Yeah. Exactly. By the way, if you haven't gone and seen it, free on YouTube, available. Um, I think it's a two-part series. Uh, called the Lobby U.S. or the Lobby USA or something like that, yeah. uh, which is this really excellent undercover reporting, like um, hidden camera stuff about the Israeli lobby in the United States. Really? It's it, very revealing, and it's really quite interesting. And it illustrates something that I'd, I'd like to mention here, which is, you know, this person's idea that um, we, we limit contributions and who they can come from and so forth will have absolutely zero impact whatsoever. Because yeah. if you watch the lobby, you see they have all kinds of little ways of contributing it through third parties and splitting it up and contributing under some other, you know, uh, under the auspices of something else so that it doesn't come up as a as a campaign contribution. So, and what, like, so what would your answer to this be? Just let any group give any amount of money to anybody? Yeah, I, I think that that's fine, actually. I don't have a problem with um, Israel influencing... Um, the decisions of our government uh, through their lobbying. Uh, what I have a problem with is that they seem to have more of a say than the American people do. Yeah. Um, well, and of course I, they but, would. They're, they're going to have more money to offer. Yeah. Well, but the the answer is the you know the aphorism that I, I've said on here before, which is that if you want um, money out of politics, you got to get politics out of money. Yeah. Well, I'd agree um, with that. The, the answer to it is to take away the power of the government to influence as many things as it does. Yeah. Because as long as the government can determine winners and losers in a market or, or in any other aspect of society, then people are going to pay to be a winner. Well, that's where you won me over because I wasn't with you till now. But you're right. I mean, because you're never going to get the money out of it. You're never going to convince these groups not to in some way – try to influence the politicians. The way you're going to get them to not want to influence them as much is not not for the politicians to not have so much power. Yeah, make it unprofitable for them to give money. Yeah. No, I, I'm now I'm with you. Okay. You won me back. Yay. <laughs> well, on that note, um, we may as well transition to the next topic. All right. Um, which, is, uh, which is our good news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so – Maybe even better news than me convincing you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> is that, uh, well, yeah, it depends on how this works out. Um, is that we may, and I, I think we've talked about this on the podcast before. I, I hope we have, um, like a little positivity. But we may actually be 
drawing down and leaving Afghanistan. Man, wouldn't that be amazing? We went into Afghanistan in 2001. Yep, I remember. It is. Big 2019. <laughs> We've it's... been there almost 18 years. Wow. And we have accomplished uh, essentially nothing. Yeah. I mean, um, really nothing. I mean, nothing nothing tangible, for sure. But it does seem like they... I mean, everybody who's been involved in these talks in Doha, um, uh, Qatar, has been saying that, that they're making progress. Uh, things are looking positive. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, they were thinking that they would have a deal signed um, before the uh, Eid, 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 anyway, the, the last Muslim uh, holiday. Really? Um, they didn't. Yeah. Um, but everybody went home and said that they were going to talk with their respective that leadership was, about some... They were still you know, moving the right direction. Yeah, some wasn't sticking like, points. It wasn't like talks broke down or anything. Right. It's just we're not... Yep, and they're going to go back. across the line yet. Yeah. yeah, they're going to go back. They're going to continue the talks. It, it is... I mean, it, it seems to me, and I, it could be wrong in my assessment, but, you know, based on what I've read and what I've seen, um, it seems to me that, that Trump has given um, Zalmay Khalilzad, who's our negotiator... Uh, kind of free reign to make this happen. Like, well, do what you need to do to make sure that Al Qaeda doesn't re-enter Afghanistan yeah. and get our troops out. Yeah. Well, I tell you, it's in Trump's interest politically to do this mm -hmm. because the country wants us out of there. I mean, overall, at least. Um, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that that kind of believe the narrative and have would have a stay for there forever. Yeah. But I think politically if he can if he can pull this out off mm -hmm. before twenty twenty, it it could help him. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it would be huge, I think. Yeah. Um it would also uh take away a big part of the Democrats uh talking points. Yeah. Um what they were talking about in the uh in the debates was you know, ending the war in Afghanistan, pulling troops out of Afghanistan. If Trump does that now yeah. then they, 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 they lose completely that. lose his yeah. 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 Um, and like you say, uh, that's a big reason that a lot of people voted for him. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely is. And, I mean, if I yeah. had voted for him, that would have been the reason. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is him absolutely. saying, "Yeah, we got to end these stupid wars overseas that aren't, yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah. aren't in the America's interest, etc." Yep. Um, but with him, with us seeming to be close, and him talking about it more, um, there it has generated. A lot of pushback from all the sources you'd accept, expect <laughs> yep. um, about, uh, you know, that we have to stay or the country will fall apart or what will happen next or, you know. <laughs> because um, it's not falling apart with us there. Right. I mean, we're literally blowing it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I got more on that later, too. We'll, um, we can definitely address some of how much blowing up we've done yeah. in Afghanistan. Uh, besides just like the... <coughs> The interesting point, and you know, Trump's a businessman, and um, you know, we have spent the United States taxpayer, remember, yeah. Yeah. United States Our taxpayer, uh, because government doesn't have any money of its own, yep. um, has spent uh, somewhere between four and seven trillion dollars on the terror war since 2001. Wow. Um, actually, I think just in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, I was going to um, say that can't be overall. I mean, that's got to be well, uh, localized to a few countries. <laughs> I mean, our spending in Somalia and Mali and yeah. Syria and all these other places, it, it doesn't amount to nearly the not, kind of spending that we've done. Not pushing up the numbers. Yeah. In Iraq and Afghanistan, um, yeah. where we've been really concentrated. But um, the arguments uh, essentially rely on this safe haven myth. Yeah. Um, we keep coming back to the safe haven myth. Even my mother, I was talking with my mother about it and how great it would be if we pulled our troops out of Afghanistan. And she yeah. said she thought that it was a bad idea because we know what happens if we're not there. Well, and that's, and I was like, I get what push, happens? Yeah, I get pushed back for the same type thing. And all I can think is like, so we're over here, we're bombing these countries and doing all this stuff to all of these people. How do we believe that that we're making friends this way like we all we're doing it, it's blowback we're creating more terrorists mm -hmm. every time you accidentally have collateral damage and some families die anybody that was in in that family's bubble is mm -hmm. now a potential terrorist because they're not going to stand for that yeah uh and actually um 
what Scott Horton, and I like the use of this term. Yeah. Um, so just to define uh, a little bit, blowback is the um, unexpected results or uh, unforeseen results of a secret foreign policy agenda. Ah, okay. Like 9 so 11. I'm, so I may be misusing this term. Maybe. Yeah. 9 11 would be blowback. Okay. Um, yeah. In that, you yeah. know, we were. We were warring across the Middle East, and the American people, for the most part, didn't Didn't know know about about it. it. Um, That they, uh, you know, that these people attacked uh, attacked us on nine eleven because we were using Saudi Arabia as a base to bomb Iraq for a decade, or yeah, Iraq for a decade. Yeah, which is Um, part of the reason why they were the the powers that be were so successful to get us involved in these things mm -hmm. because. For the average observer, mm-hmm. when nine eleven happened, that was just out, it was of, out the blue. of nowhere. Right? It was yeah. like, why are they doing this to us? Yeah, and so then because the government, they hate our freedoms, don't exactly, you? Exactly, know? and that yeah. that led plenty of room for the government or people of the government to step in and be like, well, they hate us because our freedom. Because yeah. there, there's no other reason. There's no other explanation. Right. Meanwhile, when you start digging in, yeah, there's plenty of other explanations. Yeah. They just don't want you to. Is American it. imperialism in the Middle East for forty years? Yeah. Um. And or. Yeah, more. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, what Scott Horton, the term that he's been using for this kind of thing, which yeah. is the results of the government's overt policy, <laughs> yes. um, overt foreign policy resulting in these kind of losses, that we should all understand if we're paying any attention at all, is backdraft. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, um, this would be backdraft. Yeah. Okay. I like it. Gonna, I like it too. I'm going to adopt I'm, it. <laughs> I'm perfectly content with promoting his word for this. <laughs> yes. Um, so, actually, I don't even know that it's his. I, I'm pretty sure he gave credit to somebody else, but I can't remember who it was. Right. So. At any rate, we're, we're adopting it. I read Scott Horton, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, I, and I, I was really surprised at my mom. And then I thought, well, no, actually, it doesn't matter what major media source you listen to. They're all on board with this idea that, oh, yeah. if we leave Afghanistan, it's just going to fall to the terrorists again. And, the, yep. you know, all the terrorists will move back into Afghanistan. And, um, you know, so we have to maintain a military presence to prevent it from being a safe haven. Yeah. So I compiled a list of things that I think give fair indication that this is, in fact, a myth. Which we're going to call Mike's Top Nine. Mike's Top Nine. <laughs> um yeah, I, nine's my favorite number. So, and I figured nine was enough, hopefully, to convince people. At least if you do a little follow up, you don't have to believe me. There's plenty of information out oh, there yeah. to, Go to look check it up. on. So, um, and so to start with, I'm actually going to start with number one. I'm not going to. Okay, we're going to start from one and go to nine. Yeah. Oh, we can't um, stop from the bottom. Okay. No, I mean then it doesn't make sense. Then that's it's not, not going to flow. I, yeah. That's not how you wrote it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had one piece of paper. I didn't start with nine. I started with one. Um, Fair enough. So uh, first. The September 11th attackers uh, entered the U.S. on on normal tourist and student visas, and they launched their attacks from Massachusetts, Virginia, and New Jersey. Okay. They they didn't launch the attacks from Afghanistan or any other safe terrorist safe haven. <coughs> they launched the attacks from cities within the, In the United US. States. Yeah. Right. Um, number two, we're. I guess we're going to actually count these down. Yeah, we are. We're doing it, man. Um, Number two, uh, the attacks were planned primarily in Malaysia, Germany, Spain, California, Florida, and Maryland. Yeah. They weren't planned in In Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, And and just as a side note, the, uh, the attackers in Maryland were like, literally down the street from an NSA office. <laughs> I, they probably crossed paths with and maybe even interacted with NSA agents and their like wives and families constantly. constantly. <laughs> wow. I um, didn't realize the NSA had been around that long. I thought it was more of a product of the of 9/11. Well, they certainly got more funding afterwards. Yeah. Um but the the real agency that was formed after 9/11 was the Homeland Security. Ah, okay. That's that's um, the one. So. And of course, the, then like the TSA got a huge uh, well, yeah. bump because they took over security and all of these, yeah. well, and I, all I, of the airports. Instead I knew, of it being T- I knew TSA was born of nine eleven. Basically, yeah. I mean, a yeah. tiny little agency blown up into. Mm-hmm. Um, the third. <laughs> number three. <laughs> number three. Uh, the perpetrators of the attacks were uh, Saudi and Egyptians. Ah. Um, I mean, we yeah. knew that already, but. Yeah. 
They were Saudi and Egyptians. They weren't Afghans. And None by, of them. And, and by the way, we didn't attack either of those countries. So. Yeah, uh, and we are not currently securing them either. No, we are not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, number four. <laughs> um, Al-Qaeda was wiped out in Afghanistan by the end of 2002. It took like a year yeah. for us to wipe out Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. They've been gone for Afghanistan f- for 17 years, Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Um, the uh, you'll remember that Bin Laden was killed in Pakistan, yep. not Afghanistan, because he had to leave Afghanistan because he wasn't safe there anymore. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, he and like two hundred other guys, yeah. which was all which, that was which, left of Al Qaeda at but, that time. Yeah, which by the way, so they they were in Afghanistan, they weren't safe there, so they left and went somewhere else. I mean, there these things are always going to shift. And by the way, there's plenty of real estate in Pakistan. For stuff like that. Yeah. Like, and Pakistan's an ally. Yeah, they, yes, they are. So we couldn't just, like, go bomb indiscriminately yeah. well, in Pakistan. We did do not, plenty of bombing in Pakistan, not by the only, way. Not only, correct me if I'm wrong, Pakistan is a nuclear power. Yes, they are. And we that, talked about that yeah. last week. This is That's an important point. Yeah. We, we can go around bombing all these countries that aren't nuclear powers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, we're a little more, a little more mm. skeptical of... Yeah. I mean, we had an agreement with the Tariki Taliban in Pakistan that we yeah. were waging a drone war in Pakistan against the remnants of, of Al Qaeda. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, and then actually another side note on this point that I I wish more people knew. So here's the, an opportunity. The few dozen <laughs> of you out there that are listening, um, we had the. We, we probably could have ended this completely uh, very quickly. Um, we had uh, bin Laden, um, Zawahiri, and about the 200 or so remaining Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. We had them trapped yeah. um, at Tora Bora. And <coughs> the, um, the CIA and Delta Force uh, operators that had them had them trapped essentially there weren't enough of them to cover the entire border with Pakistan yeah. they asked for reinforcements so they could cover the entire border and um Bush the younger uh denied sending um marines and rangers up to help them reinforce the border and oh. so these al qaeda guys were permitted essentially to slip, to slip across the border into wow. Pakistan that's crazy i wouldn't i mean it seems like you pull out all the stops there man yeah well i think that there I mean, here's a little bit of the tinfoil hat bit, but I think that the intention was for the war to go on. Yeah. Um, I well, don't think that because, they wanted to end it. Because right if there. we had Obama, or Obama, if we had Osama's head, that could lead to the end of the war. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we hadn't even invaded Iraq yet. Yeah. Well, exactly. Which, <laughs> tinfoil hat, I think was kind of the plan all along. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we started in Afghanistan, but the mm-hmm. goal was to me, and I felt this way even during that time when this was going on. Because, I mean, I'll tell you, I was paying pretty close attention when all of this happened. I was actually, at the time, I was okay with going into Afghanistan. But Mm -hmm. where Bush lost me was when we went into Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the whole reason we went, part of the reason we went to Afghanistan was to lay the groundwork to go into Iraq. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, we have the, um, was it General Wesley Clark got on Democracy Now! or wherever. I, I can't remember. Um, I mean, you can pull it up on YouTube, though, yeah. um, and listen to General Wesley Clark tell the story about how he went into the Pentagon and, and somebody he knew handed him a memo after 9-11. And it was only like a few weeks after 9-11 yeah. where they were talking about using it as an excuse to do uh, seven regime changes in five years. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's all the places that we've been. That was, yeah. you know, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Syria, Syria. Uh, yeah. Somalia. Uh, Sudan, um, Libya, um, in Iran, I lost count, so I, I can't yeah, remember if I named them all, but like all it was these the, places. It was the whole list, though. I remember yeah. hearing about that. Yeah. Um, I, we should really pull that clip so that we can like throw it in here whenever we bring it up, because yeah. like, this we is need, a really important We need to point. go on at some point and capture that clip and play yeah. it on the podcast. Yeah. Because um, it is, it's important because the timeline may have been wrong, mm-hmm. but we, we've absolutely done yeah. that. Like, I mean, this is what we've attempted. tried to do. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, so, yeah, there's one of those rabbit holes. I told you, man. 
so number five. <laughs> um, the primary source of terrorism in the West since 9-11 is from homegrown terrorists. Yeah. Um, and they are usually citing our meddling in the Middle East as a reason for doing what they're doing. Imagine um, that. Um, a prime example would be the uh, Major Nadal Hassan. Uh, he was the guy responsible for the Fort Hood shooting. Um, I mean, this is a guy who was U.S. military. Yeah. And... And he was a major. Like, he'd worked his way up. Yeah, he, uh, he wasn't a low guy. Yeah. yeah. And um, and he said that, you know, the reason, one of the, or at least one of the reasons that he that he um, committed the shooting, that he attacked his brothers in arms, yeah. um, was that he, because he was angered about the stories of, uh, of um, war crimes committed by U.S. military in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, and and a bunch of these guys like Omar Mateen, uh, who was the Orlando nightclub shooter, well, nightclub and shooter, yeah. um, oh, I can't remember all these people's names, but anyway, like There's most a pretty of the, good laundry list of them. Though. Yeah, the yeah. the Boston Marathon bomber, yeah. like all of these people, they've cited our wars in the Middle East and as a reason for doing what they were doing. Yeah, um, and just imagine if. If the roles were reversed, right? If you lived in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan was dropping bombs all over the United States, and you had family still here over in the United States, friends, whatever, you'd you'd immigrated to um, Afghanistan. Now, they can't do this because they don't have an air force. They don't have a (laughs) navy. They're literally no threat to the United States whatsoever. But say that they were. For the sake of argument. Yeah. Um, imagine if you were an American living as an Afghani citizen legally yeah. in Afghanistan and you still had family and friends over here and Afghanistan was dropping bombs all over the place yeah. in the United States and maybe somebody you know died. Yeah. Might that maybe make you a little upset with the government of and, the country you were living in? And push you to do some stuff that's mm-hmm. not wise. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Yeah, this I, I think the the whole argument of we got to fight them over there so we don't have to fight them over here has been completely turned on its head. Yeah. I, I don't know how anybody can still believe that idea because what we've done by fighting them over there is created them over here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> so um, moving on All right. to number six, hmm. um, the current and I'm going to do air quotes yeah. havens. Yeah. Current havens. Um, for terrorists are really Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Libya. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anything strike you <coughs> about that list of countries that they may, something they may have in common? Yeah, we've spent a lot of time in those countries. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, these are all countries that have suffered under um, extensive military engagement by the United States. Exactly. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised. And uh, excepting Syria, they're all essentially leaderless. Yeah. Well, um, thanks to us. Yeah, we've taken down the governments in yep. all of these countries. Yep. Um, so there's no law and order. And uh, the truth is that in these places where we've taken them down, um, Saddam Hussein was no friend of the terrorists. No. Um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi was no friend of the terrorists. Same thing. Um, yep. uh, in fact, Gaddafi is, was the most receptive to us after 9-11. Yeah. I well, mean, and Bashar al-Assad, actually, like yeah. his government was doing... Um, intense, well, no, what do they call it? Not intense interrogations. Enhanced. Um, enhanced interrogations for us. Yeah. Uh, after 9-11 also. I mean, these are all people that were very friendly to the United States. Yeah. And they were secular leaders. Yeah. And this is kind of an important point, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, Bashar al-Assad's the only one that's hung on. Yeah. Uh, but he has certainly been opposed to the, the terrorist organizations in his country. Yeah. They're a threat to him, too. Exactly. Um, and the the same is also true of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Yeah. They were no friend to Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Um, they kept giving him haven there, uh, mostly because of the Islamic um, requirement to to of hospitality. Yeah. Um, but they kept giving him conditions that he wasn't following, and they were really unhappy with him. Yeah. And I read some reporting by, uh, not Seymour Hirsch, but somebody with a name like that anyway <laughs> yeah. um who was saying that he was talking to uh Taliban uh members in in Afghanistan after uh the US killed Osama bin Laden yeah and we're asking them what they thought about about us killing Osama bin Laden and they're like well we don't care 
Yeah. Like, we didn't have any allegiance to Osama bin Laden. We had yeah. allegiance to Mullah Omar. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden essentially was a pain in the ass. And we don't really, <laughs> we don't really care about that. Yeah. You know, whatever. Yeah. Dead or alive, doesn't matter to us. Yeah. So, um, anyway, it, it, so the only one of those leaders that's left is Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. And uh, and as we'll find from some of these later points, points, yeah, um, you know, we haven't done him any favors and have actually acted against our own interests by trying to take him down. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so, but Libya is the worst one actually right now. They have a yeah. they have no government whatsoever. Yeah. We've completely toppled that nation. It is a completely failed state. There is no law and order whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Um. They've got two. Uh, fighting warlords right now that we can't seem to pick a side. It's yeah. probably just as well. We should stay out of it Just entirely. leave it alone, yeah. Let um, them hash it out themselves. Uh, although I think that we're... I think that we're promoting Hadi, is that... I don't remember the name. I, don't know um, I was following this for a little bit, but then I decided there's just like too much to follow and I couldn't keep <laughs> yeah. up. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they have open-air slave markets. That is the, the biggest point of the immigration into the EU. All these yeah. people trying to escape Libya because it's a completely failed state. Okay. There's no prospects. Yeah. I mean, people are literally like swimming out into the Mediterranean hoping to get picked Just up. Just to get away, yeah. yeah. Um, so, the havens are a result of our activity, probably. Yeah. I mean, it's reasonable to assume yeah. that the existing havens in the Middle East and North Africa are a result of our activity, of the U.S. military well, activity. What did Hillary Clinton say after um, Gaddafi was killed? We came, we saw, he died. He died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Yep. laughs> exactly. I, I can probably do that cackle, but I don't want to blow out everybody's ears. Um, so, number seven. Uh, then, well, I mean, there was a conflation right from the beginning, but we shifted our focus from Al-Qaeda to the Taliban yep. in Afghanistan. Um, and <coughs> it was really because Al-Qaeda was gone, so we didn't have anybody else to fight. We had to come up with something. Yeah, <laughs> and so we chose the Taliban, who, like I said, had never really been a friend of Al Qaeda. They weren't supporting Al Qaeda; they're a separate entity. Yeah. It's like the difference between the government in New York and the mafia. Yeah. Um, the Taliban are are the Pashtun tribal leadership or government, however you want to look at it. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you don't want to, if you could, couldn't even think of a better example of how this has been a complete waste and why we should just go ahead and leave. Um, if we've been fighting the Taliban for the last 18 years, the Pentagon just released a report that said that the Taliban controls more territory now than they have at any time since 2001. <laughs> so clearly we're not very good at this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if if this is what our presence looks like as far as limiting the power of the Taliban, yeah. then we should probably just pack up and go home. Yeah. Now, And the, the difference is really as much as anything else. Like Al-Qaeda was a bunch of international terrorists. They were spread out across the Middle East. They were mostly in Afghanistan, I guess, at that point. There were a couple hundred there. I mean, but there were about 400 total guys probably spread across North Africa and the Middle East with yeah. the bulk of them in Afghanistan after 9-11. Um, now, we managed to increase that number by killing friends and families. A lot of people joined the jihadis, <laughs> you know, because they wanted some kind of revenge. But um, so the al-Qaeda is a bunch of international terrorists. The Taliban is a bunch of Pashtun tribal guys. Yeah. They're defending their home turf. Yeah. There's a huge you're, difference there. Yeah, you're not going to get rid of these guys. Like, yeah. yeah, they're this. It's like you come into our our um, Alabama or whatever. Yeah. being like we this is it. this is my lawn. Yeah, this is yeah. You, I mean, over my dead body. Right, <laughs> and, and better, that's exactly and gonna, how they're and you're gonna and you're gonna pile them up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's just like trying to to fight in Vietnam. Yep. If you're on their home turf and they're getting to fight a guerrilla war, yeah, it it can go on in, indefinitely. Yeah, like, I mean you're you're not going to win that. Yeah, it is a it is an unwinnable war, and like Tulsi said in the first debate, um, the uh, Taliban was there long before we arrived, and they'll be long they'll be there long after we leave. Oh, absolutely. So, waste of time. Um, number eight, we're almost there. Woohoo! <laughs> Oh, are you ready to be done with this already? Okay. Um, the U.S. involvement in the Middle East essentially created ISIS. Like, yeah. we, we ended up focusing on ISIS at some point, saying this is the new enemy that we have to deal with, ISIS. Yeah. Oh, my God, ISIS. Which, by the way, we, we created through our actions. Right. 
Um, we ISIS was created uh, by invading Iraq, yep. uh, essentially in the first place, and they were um, they swelled uh, by us by the U.S. funding them and supporting them to try as the moderate rebels, and I'm doing the air quotes again, <laughs> yeah. as the moderate rebels in Syria to try and force regime change of Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. Um, so after we we took down Iraq. Yeah. Um, then we started s- supporting these same Sunni jihadists that we had fought in Iraq in Syria. We're supporting the Sunni jihadists now against um, Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Yeah. <coughs> now you got it. Uh-oh. Yeah. This ain't good. Uh, this is why I don't let you ever want to do this. <laughs> right? Uh, um, so uh, we... The ISIS was an offshoot of al-Qaeda. It was the more radical... Group of Al Qaeda. Yeah. Um, in Syria, they uh, became the Al Nusra Front. Hmm. Uh, Al Qaeda became the Al Nusra Front, and Al Nusra became ISIS. Yeah. Um, essentially, it's these same Sunni jihadists, and they aren't the moderate rebels. They're the radicals. Yeah. They're the farthest end of the spectrum. Yeah. And and we were arming them. We were funding <laughs> and arming them in Syria. And I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but there are stories that they. Because we screwed up, and this is this is actually number nine. So I'll just move to number nine, right, and then we'll going, come back to going. this. Um, after we took down Iraq, uh, we realized suddenly um, that what we had just done is take out the only Sunni power opposing Iran um, in the Middle East, or the major Sunni power opposing the Shia Iran yeah. in the Middle East. Um, so we were like, "Ooh, whoops." Um, that's we, not what we wanted to do. We swung the pendulum we, too far. Yeah, we just empowered Iran in Iraq by taking out the Sunni minority government and allowing the Shias to take control yeah. of Iraq now, too. Uh, so then we did what they call the redirection, yeah. where we shifted our focus now to Iran to try and contain Iran in the Middle East that we just empowered. Yeah. And so the way we did that was by – we couldn't – I mean, we couldn't go right back into Iraq – and fight the same war, but on the other side. <laughs> on the other side, right? <laughs> yeah. Because then, you know, even Americans that don't pay a lot of attention would realize Are be like, that, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, what are we doing isn't, here, guys? Isn't this the guys that we were just fighting we against just won this war. last yeah. year? Um, yeah. Now we're fighting with... Now they're our ally. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody seems to have made a mistake. And they wouldn't have a good way of explaining it to us. Yeah. Um, there's just no way. So... Uh, the result of that, though, was that we, we had to hit them through proxy. So that's what the Syria thing came from. That's also yeah. where Yemen came from. Yeah. Even though Iran doesn't actually directly support the Houthis in Yemen. Yeah. Um, the In fact, the Houthis... They're just they're, right? they're Zaydi... They're actually Zaydi Shiite. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's the one connection, is yeah. that they're, they're Shia also. Yeah. But it's a Shia sect that's actually a lot closer to Sunni, as I understand it, than hmm. it is to Shia. Interesting. Yeah, um, but anyway, just that that Shiite connection makes them a uh, an Iranian proxy, uh, and I think that the support that Iran gives to the Houthi in Yemen, um, best I can figure based on what I'm reading, is that they uh, agree with what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, no, no, like physical support. I yeah. guess. Or, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So, but the main one was Syria. Yeah. So when we decided we'd screwed up and we just fought a war for Iran and Iraq, um, we decided that we had to take Iran down a peg. Yeah. And so we started the war in Syria um, against their ally uh, yeah. in Bashar al-Assad. And so the same groups that we had been fighting against just won a war against in Iraq. Yeah. We are now um, funding and providing arms to in Syria. Wow. Yeah. And there are stories of uh, Sunni jihadist groups that were like fighting Americans on the Iraqi side of the border, yeah. fleeing from the Americans into Syria, getting arms teaming up with the Americans, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting arms and ammunition from the Americans in Syria, and then crossing back across the border into Iraq to fight the Americans again. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is how screwed up our foreign policy is in the Middle East. Yeah, which is why we just gotta wash our hands of it. I just I don't know. Yeah. And in Yemen, um, we are we have been uh, through our support of the 
opposition to the Houthis in Yemen, yeah. um, we have been actually funding and arming AQAP, Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula, oh, really? um, in their fight against the, the Houthis in Yemen. Wow. So um, this to me, and Obama and John Brennan, uh, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, I, I was blown away, and we we might have talked about it at the time. The pod, it's nice to, to know that the podcast has run long enough yeah. that I can think we probably talked about this before, but I can't remember. Yeah, All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might have talked about this when maybe, it came up. Maybe we did. Um, but uh, do you remember after Trump met with Putin and John Brennan got on whatever morning show that was and called Trump a traitor? Oh, and all yeah, that. Do you remember yeah, that? Do you okay. remember all that? Man, I went ballistic when I heard that. Because <laughs> I was like, if anybody's a traitor, it's John Brennan who was literally arming our enemy. The only <laughs> only group that ever attacked us in the United States, Al-Qaeda, was literally arming our enemy in the Middle East. <laughs> this is the guy who's the traitor. Yeah. That That's like... A literal definition of treason yeah, right. is providing material support to the enemies of the United States. <laughs> and that's what he was doing. Could bring him up on those charges. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I wish that we could. And sure. just a little a side point on that. Like, you know, there's all this talk about impeaching Trump for, um, what is it? Uh, Collusion? No, no, no. Obstruction of justice. Oh, obstruction. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So, you know, charging Trump with obstruction of justice for... Uh, hampering an investigation into an event that never happened, which <laughs> right. is already like insanity. Yeah, um, but and that's a stupid way to try and impeach him. There's yeah. plenty of things to impeach Trump on, yeah. and one of those things is this war in Yemen. <laughs> right. uh, the war in Yemen would be the best thing to impeach Trump on. Yeah. Like this is a totally illegal war. We're, we're waging a war of starvation against the civilians of Yemen. Yeah, um, it is a humanitarian disaster of our making. Yep. And um, it's just like a terrible, terrible thing that we're doing, and it's completely illegal to begin with. Yeah. And that would be an, a thing to easily impeach Trump on, yeah. uh, based on the Constitution. Yeah. But <laughs> they can't do it. Yep. And the reason they can't do it is because if you started to dig into it, you would say, oh yeah, but Obama started this war. Yep. And so if you impeach Trump for it, you have to indict Obama for yeah. it. Obama's just as culpable. Yeah. Yep. So that's why it won't ever be done. And that's also why John Brennan won't ever be drawn into this thing. It's oh, yeah. because you'd have to bring Obama in. Because you'd have to pull two. The, when you start opening those doors, they, they lead you down a huge rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, so just a, a last point on this, and then we'll get back to the positive part that this war in <laughs> Afghanistan may end soon. I just want you all to know why when they start making this argument about the safe haven, it, it, it is just a myth. Yeah. Here's your argument. These there's all these points as to why that's a that's an absurd argument to keep us yeah. in perpetual war in Afghanistan. Yeah. And because that's what you're asking. I mean, mm-hmm. if if you believe in the safe haven myth, there's no situation that ever brings the troops home. You're just you're just committing us to permanent war, which there's a lot of people that wouldn't mind that. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is the reason there's such a hard push for it. Yeah. But but those people would be wrong. Yeah. Well, the, in general, I think the populace of the United States does not agree. Agreed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that I think that there's a, that the the people are on our side on this mm-hmm. one. The and, country um, is on our side. Just to couch all of this, and then and then again, we'll come back to the try and come back to the positive to end this <laughs> off. But I mean, just so you know, like if you believe in the value of life generally, yeah. Then if and if you're honest about it then you have to agree that the value of an Afghani life is just as valuable as an American life or an Iraqi life. Oh, I, yeah. And so, um, you know, we talked about last week how I I think this dehumanizing of foreign casualties is part of the reason that people are devaluing life back home and and these shootings and so forth. And, um, but, uh, so I pulled these, statistics as best I could. I mean, it's hard to get real specific um, on this stuff. Like, there's not exact statistics, obviously. But in Iraq, um, since we started the war there in 2003, uh, they are estimating approximately 180,000 civilian deaths from violence. Really? 
Um, and that's a conservative estimate. I saw estimates up to about 220. Really? Yeah. So the lowest number I found was like 182 or something like that. Or maybe it was 178. Yeah. It was right around 180. Right in though. that neighborhood, yeah. Yeah, so 180,000 civilian deaths. I mean, that includes children um, and that's just whole... non-combatants in general. Yeah. Right? Um, in Afghanistan, it's a more sparsely populated country. Yeah. Um, in Afghanistan, the estimate was about 31,000 civilian deaths. Um, and uh, in the first quarter of this year, there were more deaths from the pro-central Afghan government, the, the government out of Kabul, um, which is the U.S.-supported government. So essentially, the U.S. and the Afghan uh, security force had caused more civilian deaths than the Taliban had. Wow. And that's in the first quarter of this year. Hmm. But in total, just between these two countries, Iraq and Afghanistan, in the last 18 years, there has been approximately a quarter million deaths due to violence from the wars. For just from the wars? From civilians. Yeah. Uh, just civilians. That's yeah. not including combatants that's not at even, all. Yeah, that's not even people fighting. Yeah. That's just the, the bystanders. Yeah. And it's been about 2,500 American Which, lives, if that's the part that really matters to you. Yeah. Which goes to show, I mean, we wouldn't, if that, we've never really been in a war in this country where civilian deaths really ranked up there like that. I mean, all every time we go to war, it's Civil always, war. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess the Civil War would be the, the main one. Yeah. Definitely in modern time. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't, it's it's just something, it's it's distant. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we're going out in search of monsters to destroy us. Yeah. Uh, um, John Quincy Adams warned us against. So. Yes, he did. On our last podcast, I believe. <laughs> did he? Right. Was that our last podcast? Might have been. I don't remember. You've used that quote on the podcast. Yeah. I, know that. I, I, I like that one. That's good. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess we'll end it there with the positive note that it, it looks, looks like, like. Hopefully this is coming to an end. Yeah. That, I, that there's a strong chance. I but, think that there's a real legitimate chance that by the end of this year, yeah. we will have no troops in Afghanistan. Man, oh, that would be so amazing. It, it really might just be wishful be. thinking, but I really it, think it's possible. It may be. We'll, I, don't, I don't know that we'll see that by the end of the year. Maybe. I mean, it would be, I mean, that would be something to celebrate. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's the Taliban's uh, like non-negotiable. That's what they want. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Is complete American troop withdrawal. Now, I I will say that what's going to happen then, of course, and I I don't think this is preventable one way or another, honestly, um, is that, you know, the Taliban controls more than half the country. They don't want the Kabul, the Western-placed Kabul government um, to be in charge of the country. And I think it is likely that they will push into Kabul and take over the whole country. Yeah. No, Even grows. through the troop, troop surge 2009, 2010, yeah. like, it didn't really make that much of a difference. We yeah. can't fight these people left out of their home turf. Yeah, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, without like destroying the whole country. And yeah. you know, Trump himself has said, well, we can do this, but we're going to cause such a tremendous number of casualties that I just don't think it's worth it. Yeah. I agree. I don't think it's yeah, worth it. I agree, too. Um, they're no threat to us. Yep. And so when we win, if we pull out of Afghanistan, it is likely that the Taliban will take over the whole country. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean... But the, the agreement was that they'll keep Al-Qaeda out. Yeah. As long and as they have they, a vested interest in that. Yeah. It's not like they're acting against their own best interest. Mm-hmm. So... So, um, yeah. I, I think that we... If, if we're lucky, Trump might actually end a war. He'll be the first <laughs> president to end a war since... Since when? <laughs> um, I mean, I would say Bush Sr. Uh, after Desert Storm, but the truth is we actually continued that war. Well, didn't... Um, until Iraq War II. We were still bombing Iraq. Yeah, but didn't W do this throughout. big victory thing where he flew in the jet and said, said we won after Iraq? Yeah, but we didn't leave. <laughs> Yeah, but he he said he said we won. Yeah, if we didn't leave, we the war wasn't over. <laughs> uh, um, although, <laughs> by that logic, we're still in World War Two because we got bases in Germany and Japan. Still well, there also, you go. You know. Okay. Um, oh well. So, anyway, hopefully, we might actually end a war, and that would be really exciting. That would yeah. be worth celebrating. We'll have a special have, podcast for that. If yes, that we will. Um, yes, we will. In the meantime. 
I uh, hope you've enjoyed this and learned something. Um, if you have any questions where I got this information or anything, let me know. I do recommend that everybody read Scott Horton's book, uh, Fool's Aaron, Time oh, to End the yes. War in Afghanistan. Um, if you uh, if you didn't believe in the war, then it'll give you plenty of arguments against it. If you did believe in the war, I don't know how you'll be able to still believe in it after you've read it. It'll make you question it. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's really well put together and, uh, and he's got a new one coming out. Um, I contributed to, by the way, uh, I gave him a hundred bucks to, to finish up this new book and get it printed and all that stuff. Um, I don't know what it's called yet. Yeah. He was kind of cagey about that when we talked to him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> he didn't really act like he had a title. <laughs> um, but well, he did put one out there, but it was like, it's like a working title. So, yeah. and, uh, and this one's going to be about all the wars. Um, and I recommend you support his stuff anyway because he's doing a valuable service through antiwar.com and through the Scott Horton show. Oh, without um, question. There's a, a tremendous amount of information, like real journalism, that's not getting out there that he is promoting. Yep. So um, I, I'll promote him every chance I get. That's not true. I haven't promoted him on every podcast. <laughs> and there's been every opportunity to. But I like to promote yeah. us as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, like and share. Um, you know, if you if you like what you're hearing, definitely share it with your friends. Uh, we're trying to get it out to as many people as we can. The more people we put it in front of, the better. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that we're doing something valuable here, and I hope you think so too. And uh, you know, visit our website. I still haven't gotten around to writing anything. Um, <laughs> I will. I mean, I write stuff all the time. I just don't finish anything. Yeah, got got to got to go and yeah, do that. Yeah, need man. some follow through. Yep. Um, hey, you know, it, it can just like this podcast. It can just keep dragging on. Like I think of more <laughs> things that I haven't included that seem important. <laughs> and next thing you know, <laughs> yeah. And then I got like uh, you, you know wrote a book. <laughs> yeah, I got like twelve pages. I'm like nobody wants to read all this. Um, anyway, um, yeah, like and share. Uh, subscribe on iTunes and Podbean. Um, iTunes or Podbean. I guess you don't need both, one or the other. And uh, let us know what you think. Um, we we like comments. We'll do better about responding <laughs> to <laughs> <Yeah>. the comments. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, uh, try and stay free. Try and how you fight. Ciao. Later.